Good evening to the audience connected from South Korea. It's 11 o'clock in the evening for them. Buenos días a los asistentes conectados desde México. Son las 8 de la mañana para ellos. Buena tarde a la audiencia conectada desde Cataluña. Son las 3 de la tarde aquí a España. Dir busca la sesión en inglés estará accesible y subtitulada en catalán a YouTube. I am Valérie, Matter Fad Manager and Deputy Director of Fad, Fostering Art and Design, and I'm glad to welcome you all to the 2020 Matthias Farm Edition. After having explored sustainable food, nutrition, tourism, and body line marks in the two first editions of the Matthias Farm, this year Matter Fad proposes to focus on analyzing and understanding through design and crafts the opportunity thrown up by the territorial resources as a strategy for a new sustainable global economy. As part of the Neomateria exhibition organized by Materfat, together with the Trade, Crafts and Fashion Consortium of the Catalan government, SECAM, which is traveling around different Korean cities 
thanks to the support of the Korean Institute of Design Promotion, Matelfad is in touch with cutting edge Korean and Catalan designers and artisans who have brought to light research projects in materials that will undoubtedly serve as inspiration for many others professionals worldwide. Seeking to gain a broader outlook from a territorial perspective, we have invited Mexican designers and artisans to share their projects too. Thanks to the support of the SECAM, today we will celebrate one of the two consecutive talks with the topic Vegetable Derived, moderated by Robert Thompson, Scientific Director of MatterFAD. He will introduce our speakers. But first, let me introduce Mrs. Monza Vilalta Icambra, Director General of Trade, Crafts and Fashion Consortium of the Government of Catalonia, the institution that has allowed us to be together today, sharing innovation from three different continents. Thank you. Thank you, Valérie. And good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Well, I'm very pleased to participate today in this session of, of the Material Inspirational Talks, which is part of the exhibition Neomateria that the government of Catalonia is organizing together with Materfat, an exhibition that is currently traveling through different cities in Korea. Last year, this exhibition was hosted in Catalonia, in Barcelona and Tortosa, and that due to the pandemic could not visit other Catalan cities. With this joint action, we aim to highlight the relationship between the artisan and society, new formulas of creativity in which the materials have the power of transformation of the craft. Crafts is tradition, but also craft is innovation and interacts with creativity and design that responds to the challenges of society and generates well-being. Today's session will help us learn through design and craft, craftsmanship what opportunities the territory's resources offer us as a strategy to contribute to a new global and sustainable economy. I am sure that today we will know very unique projects from Mexico, Korea and Catalonia, which will serve us as inspiration for creators from all over the world. Finally, I would like to thank in particular the collaboration of all those who have made possible all the participants in these talks and that I wish it be the first of many other collaborations. Thank you very much to FAT, Mater FAT, Korea Institute of Design Promotion and Universidad Autónoma de Aguas Calientes de Mexico. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, Robert, all yours. Well, uh, I don't often get to say this, but good morning, good evening, and and good night. Um, as we are broadcasting in uh, across the world in uh, three different time zones, and so I want to give you a warm, warm welcome. Thank you for being here online. I am contacting you from Materfad. Uh, we are a research uh, library. We are also uh, consultants. Uh, we are here located in Barcelona, Spain. Please check us out as uh, we are specialists in materials and applications of materials. I also want to give a very, very special warm welcome to our three speakers of today. We have some very interesting topics that we are going to cover in terms of materials, materiality. Uh, with us today, we have Anastasia Pistofidou. She's a colleague of mine. Uh, she's an architect. She works at the Institute of Advanced Architecture in Catalonia. Uh, in 2011, she began uh, this research project with, uh, with the YAC and has been researching ever since. In 2013, she funded the uh, fabtextiles.org, which is a soft architecture, materially derived innovation uh, platform. And in 2017, she co-founded the Fab Academy, which is a textile technology and research um, process. I also want to uh, welcome Adrián López Velarde and Marte Cáceres. And uh, we are welcoming, welcoming them from uh, Mexico. 
they have founded a very, very interesting company called Antonio Di Marti. They specialize in an innovative and very exciting material called Deserto. Deserto is a plant or vegetably derived leather that in the future could compete with classical leather. I also want to give my last and warmest thanks also for the second time that she's joined us, Kim uh, Hyunju. Kim Hyunju is contacting us from Korea. She is an artistic designer with an exquisite taste towards design of nature-based and inspired products. She in fact is the winner of the Lexus Creative Master Award in 2017 and also the Frankfurt Ambiente Trends of 2015. Thank you very much for being here. Now, the topic of today is an interesting and very relevant topic. It is regarding plants. Plants are phytospecies. There are so many different types of plant species in the world, including some that have not yet been discovered. Now, an interesting quick history of plants is plants have undergone a very quick and drastic evolutionary uh, process. In 65 million years ago, since the extinction of the planet, plants have modified their DNAs such ways that they could actually produce flowers. This was an innovation in the biological sense. This also implied the co-involvement of other species like bees and butterflies. And so they had adopted an innovation strategy for survival given the drastic situation. Plants are also very interesting because plants provide the, the process of photosynthesis, a very necessary and recyclatory process of filtering gases such as CO2 and reintegrating them into the cycle of life through the process of photosynthesis. Because of this photosynthetic process, plants also are producers of many different types of materials that are very, very important for us. Everything from food to medicines to materials and pigments and also fragrances. Plants are invaluable to us and we must take an approach to adopt and perhaps synthesize some of these wonderfully nature-based chemical factories to produce different types of materials, different types of processes, and of course, foods. Plants also produce many fats, especially like coconut oil, and these are fatty acids. So some of these substances can be used also for treatment of inks or surfaces or maybe paper to bring about properties of flexibility, properties of resistance to time and oxidation. So the topic of today is a very central topic for us humans. As we face difficult times because of the global warming effect, we must change our ways, we must adopt and innovate. We must in some way be like the plants 65 million years ago, adaptation. So it is truly innovation that we are going to be celebrating today. And I will be conducting and moderating this session, perhaps asking questions. And who better to start with than Anastasia. Anastasia, it's good to see you. How are you? I'm very well, how are you? Fantastic. Very I'm happy. Wondering if, I'm wondering if you could uh, quickly enlighten us with your Biopine Tone project is amazing. I love this idea. Thank you so much. Um, yes, today I will present a project that is called Biopantone. It's uh, one of the different projects uh, we developed here uh, within the Fabric Academy program at Fabla Barcelona. And uh, I would like to uh, share my screen with you. Fantastic. So, I would like to talk about um, this uh, collaborative piece of art 
that uh, we named Biopantone, but uh, this is a form of uh, manifesting different ideas within with the art piece uh, for a better uh, world, let's say. Because in the end, uh, everything in life is a matter of choice. Uh, one can choose uh, whether he will eat uh, locally grown food or uh, fast food coming from overseas. One can uh, contribute into filling up the landfills uh, in the earth or um, tr transforming himself, herself into zero waste. Everything is a matter of choice. We can also choose whether we will be working for occupying Mars or whether we will be uh, working for uh, cleaning the sea from petroleum leaks and saving lives. We can choose whether we will use natural-based um, solutions or chemical, but we need to be aware. We need to be aware of our choices and we need to be aware uh, of what are the choices, how we can choose if we don't know. So I think that uh, it's very important when we make a choice to be conscious about that. And I believe that through education, uh, we can uh, train uh, the society to be more aware. And this is uh, how uh, this piece of art is manifesting uh, this choice. Biopanton is a collaborative canvas of natural shades created within an educational context of learning, dyeing technique and processes. It uh, combines basic chemistry education and textile craft education. It uh, represents with this contemporary format of Pantone the beauty of nature-based ancestral and artisan techniques using organic materials, food waste, flowers and roots. Colors exist in everything that surrounds us. And uh, from the here, you can see the, that the piece is also accompanied by this color bar, uh, because colors incentivate all our senses. Colors are cultural creations. They are shifting through generations, like tectonic plates. Wha what we define today as red, back uh, in a few years ago, it was a different red. And in Brazil, you have a different definition of red, ra rather in, in Europe, for example. Colors exist in everything that surrounds us from prehistoric times with drawings in the caves until the 1856 when synthetic dyes appear. So until the 19th, uh, mid, uh, late uh, 19th century, we have uh, when the first man-made synthetic dyes started to be used, we have natural dies. How can we detach ourselves so much from thousands of years of knowledge and practice? Working with natural dyes connects you to nature, stimulates all your senses, the smell of the dye bath, the sense of foraging matter from the earth. And even more, when you are working in a global, in an international network, you can learn so much about natural-based solutions and different roots and different plants that they are found all over the earth. And this is how we uh, learn from each other and uh, within this hybrid education program that we are running where this Biopanton um, get, got born. It's a... Um, it's an annual uh, process, so every year we, we create a new Biopantone and uh, we learn from the different uh, countries what are the local, um, local materials that one can use. And it is a matter of transmitting uh, artisan and craftsman knowledge and uh, that is going to be extinct. Nobody remembers anymore how uh, one can extract colors for plants and dyes. Uh, and making dyes. So 
I would like to um, conclude with a very uh, favorite um, quote from uh, uh, back Mr. Fuller, uh, what is, who was an architect and inventor and philosopher, very famous for the geodesic dome that said, basically, uh, if from little things, from little choices that we make in our lives, we can change society and we can change as individuals and as society. He was um, talking about a little mechanical uh, piece uh, in boats used in naval, uh, in naval, a naval metaphor to express that uh, we can transform, make big transformations only by little choices. And he, uh, he, he said that everyone can be a trim tab, which is this little piece that uh, this tiny mechanism in, in the steering propeller of a boat that with a little effort, it can make a big change. So he quoted in Playboy in 1972, he said, I'm positive that what you do with yourself, just the little things, they are the things that count. Thank you. Oh, Anastasia, that's great. I love that, especially the last quote. Um, you know, that's an interesting thing. Like, um, we have these traditions and the traditions change over time. And sometimes traditions, they span over long periods and they're somehow tied to the way that we view the world and our concept of value. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested and I want to get back to you a little bit later, perhaps, and see if you could share with us some of your secrets or perhaps some of your process. Um, uh, but this also reminds me of uh, a couple weeks ago, I was looking at this piece cr created by Deserto, uh, or created as Deserto, this, this material. And it was, I was so amazed at the color of this, uh, this, this fabric. And then I realized it was leather. I realized it was actually uh, not animal-derived leather. And I was really surprised about the feel of the, of the material, the softness of it. And so I looked behind it, and the only way I could tell it wasn't leather is because I looked behind it, and I saw that it had a, another layer behind it supporting it. And I've fallen in love with your materials. Uh, you know, it's it's really interesting. I'm wondering if you could tell us tell us a little bit about the story of how how is it that you were able to design and develop a leather from a plant? Sure. Thank you so much. So let me share the screen, please. So hello everybody. So my name is Marte Casares and my partner is Adrian Lopez Velarde. We are at with Marty that commercial speaking word deserto. It is a Mexican company established in 2019 in Guadalajara, Mexico. So, so, so we were working before in the automotive and in the fashion industry years ago, and we were aware about all the pollution, all the material that are involved of this industry. So we know that the fashion industry is one of the most important economic engines of the world, but it is also one of the main negative contributors to environmental and social impacts along this value chain. It's for say, so for example, it is responsible of waste accumulation, biodiversity harm, land exchange, as well as water intensive use in respect to animal and fox leather material. So we created CERTO to offer a material so that complies with the most rigorous quality and environmental standards of the industry, but without the necessity of killing animals or using any toxic plastics. Instead, we use the cactus fibers. So, yeah, and, um, yeah, and so the, Thank you. Um, so this is all for the for the presentation. If we can return to the to the camera, please. Yes. And so this is the reason why we wanted to explore making a material not only with plants but around cactus. Um, most of the plants around the world 
are C3 class species, which uh, consist of the normal metabolism uh, operation that we study in school, right? Um, car carbon dioxide absorption, uh, a chlorophyll metabolism, and emitting oxygen during daytime. So cactuses are CAM species, quite different and interesting from the rest. These are crassulation acid metabolism plants. What cactuses do is that they actually absorb the water they need <clears throat> from the humidity present in, present in the in the atmosphere, normally absorb occurring during um, the early uh, morning. It's the, the morning dew water is absorbed. And then um, all these resources are stored and utilized during nighttime. So cactuses operate the metabolism during nighttime and that's when they um, actually do their carbon dioxide absorption and grow biomass. So uh, when we started to study the efficiency of cactuses, we were amazed. Um, just to give you some, some facts here, um, in order to get one kilogram of biomass from a C3 class species on average, we need a thousand liters of water, which most likely will be needed to be irrigated. Whereas cactus only needs 200 liters of water to create the same kilogram of biomass, but with the advantage of not needing irrigation. So when we started to look at these um, competitive advantages of working um, a material out of cactus, we were shocked not only by water uh, savings, but also because of the, the growing rate of the plant. Um, it only takes six to eight months for a mature leaf to grow enough to be harvested, which is um, a, a, an scalable time frame that allow us to bring uh, a commercial scale into the market with um, these cactus-based materials. Now, um, this is not only important to mention, but we also have made a, a vast analysis around the land use change, as Marta was mentioning, and the carbon dioxide absorption of the acres of land that we have reforest with cactus. It's worth mentioning because we don't go around deforesting or, or using wild flora, whereas we reforest land that was previously open to agricultural purposes and, and then abandoned. So there is a restoration of microflora, microfauna of soil. Um, the acres blend with uh, wild biodiversity and uh, Cactuses are considered carbon sinks because their CO2 sequestration capacity is very, very interesting. Just in 14 acres of land where we plant our deserto cactuses, we are able to absorb 8,100 tons of carbon dioxide per year. And in, in that farm, to, to operate those 14 acres, we only emit 15.3 tons of CO2 to the, to the atmosphere. So you can see that the balance is it's, it's positive by far. And this gives us uh, already a competitive advantage offering a sustainable solution, not only by integrating an important proportion in a material out of cactus and reducing the use of, of, of chemistry, of um, energy and natural resources like water, but we Behind every single meter of the Certo, there is a stimulation in the agricultural sector that is fomenting the plantation of, of these acres, which are carbon sinks. Um, we are currently working on, on, on the language and how to transmit best this, this important uh, information to, to the audience because we are convinced that... Um, Plant-based contents in a material is only one avenue of sustainability, but it doesn't address all of it. We have to think in terms of land, of uh, social impacts, and uh, also carbon dioxide absorption. Um, relying on plants is by far better than relying on toxic chemicals, but we need to, to be very, very careful on What's the impact that we are generating when we are taking these plant resources? Um, so said that, we are happy to, to introduce the CERTO 
um, we have been working on innovations day by day to to keep bringing the bar up and and offering more interesting materials like a like a, um, our recycle line, which consists of the bioresin made of cactus with a recycled textile as a backer, which can be cotton or, or polyester, for instance. So thank you very much. And uh, we are open to any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Marta. That's amazing. That's an amazing uh, aspect of your project. I really love this idea, the idea of generating value into the soil, carbon capturing, uh, augmenting the productivity and cycles of, of a landscape. I think that's wonderful. I also, um, the, the backing aspect of the material is uh, clearly one opportunity of innovation as well. You know, like papers or cellulose-based even fabrics could be of, of ap applicability in this sense. And, uh, you know, with this tie-in, uh, you know, Kim, I, I would like you perhaps to talk a little bit about your project as well, because I know that you're invested in these naturally based inspired designs and and you love the idea of cellulose and hanji paper and all this. I was wondering if you could um, could enlighten us a little bit about your project. OK. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's nice to meet you. And thank you for inviting me for the Natural Year Farm 2020. Um, I'd like to introduce one of my project, Flex Over 100 Trace. Let me share the screen with you. Hang on. Um, so this is my pro one of my project, Flex Over Hanji Trays. And these are lotus leaf shaped trays made of Hanji paper. Hanji is Korean traditional paper. The trays are flexible. Um, so it comes flat, but also can be shaped it with your own hand because it has a metal structure inside. So you can manipulate the shapes. And there are different shapes as well. Lotus leaf, of course, and leaf, water lily, and maple leaf. So, so what I did focus on this project is uh, three keywords I can say. Um, natural, traditional, and sustainability. Uh, first, most of my works are highly related with nature. I use natural materials and try to show natural beauty. It can be the pattern of nature and shape of nature. I'm always inspired by nature and also respect nature. Secondly, I want to show my root through design to international audience. Tradition is very important for me and it just it doesn't mean the past only. Tradition is keep continuing and living with us and keep changing the shape by the time. I wanted to give modern life to old material, which isn't using often now because there are so many plastic or synthetic material. They may be cheaper and easier to dealing with them, you know, to manufacture with uh, synthetic materials. And traditional material for me, it also helps local manufacturing and local business. And local business and made in local society and selling in local territory, it can also help for sustainability because um, um, if we buy them in some other country in order to cost it down, and bring it back to my country where it also costs a lot and it causes a CO2 problem as well. Um, so there is a sustainability. I didn't want to use plastic coating solution to my product and I found shellac, which is natural resin. I would like to talk about a little more about Hanji paper. Hanji paper is traditional, sustainable, and reusable material. Um, and also 
for the modern world, it's an eco-friendly material because um, trees, are, trees are not cut down. The paper is made from the branches of one-year-old mulberry tree, which grows back. So the next year, um, one inch below of the previous branch, we can see new branches and using it. And this is the process of how to make hanji paper. They're using white bark of the mulberry tree and uh, clean and get rid of all impurities. Then cook them and hammering them to make them cellulose. And then um, put our dark fiber, the hanji mulberry tree fiber, put in the water tank and then doing a sheet formation. Um, and I will also talk about shellac, the natural legend material. My hanji trays are vanished with a natural shellac, which makes them water resistant. They can be, so my product are not 100% waterproof, but they can be washed by gently applying running water and wiped with a wet towel and reuse, reusable. The shellac finish is a natural legend secreted by the female lakeberg on trees in the forest of India and Thailand. It's well known as a non-toxin food safe material. So, or violin and jelly gums or food coating material, uh, many people are using shellac for a long time. So, That's it. Robot. I really love the colors that you have used in your presentation, that very light green and that kind of burgundy, uh, very natural kind of soft tone uh, choice of colors. Um, I always find it very interesting that innovation is, it involves so much risk, so much risk taking, like so much, uh, adoption of new techniques and how do we make something better and while you were showing that image of making the paper uh, i couldn't help but thinking you know maybe this could be interesting and applicable to to the deserto project so maybe there could be a backing of made of some kind of a cellulose based paper instead of a recycled textile and maybe that would change some of the applications but also there's a, it's an, it's an incredible field the field of generating inks because something so ephemeral, so small, and so so particularly based is so difficult to make from a design standpoint. And Anastasia, I know I know you must have had some difficulties in obtaining uh, specific types of color and maybe or or uniformity or or resistance to like water or sun. I was wondering if you could go through some of those uh, difficulties or successes that you've had. I believe that uh, there are many difficulties and there are colors that they are color fast, but also uh, others that they react to the uh, exposure to light. Uh, we are not talking about uh, synthetic dyes that uh, they will uh, resist uh, in uh, hundreds of washes and Maybe we need to tra transit from the concept of having the perfection. Um, we can embrace the fact that our colors will be changing and mutating uh, shades because they are alive. Uh -huh. I like that. I like the idea of imperfection in materials, uh, right? It's this thing that makes it uh, perhaps uh, more appealing from a from a fashion standpoint, or even more identifiable. Um, and also, right? it's very, very present in uh, the Japanese uh, culture with what it is called wabi-sabi, in the love of uh, the imperfection. Maybe one can um, think that every now and then uh, you will need to create these uh, natural color bombs and put them in your washing machine. And these can go as a ritual, annual ritual, where you will also be going with the trends. Exactly. Yes, that's a good point. 
Now, I'm wondering, are these inks, could they be blended into other types of like resins or maybe other, other types of like biopolymers? Like a couple of them that comes to mind are PLAs or PHAs. I'm wondering if these could be used, you know, uh, maybe even in collaboration with Antonio Di Marti in the sense of could, I, I don't know what types of inks uh, you use, but uh, would you be contrary to using perhaps bio-based inks or do you use them now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are very interested in, in acquiring different um, solutions to further evolve our materials. Um, let me share with you one example of what we have been experimenting with in the laboratory. I'm holding here in my hand the natural color of cactus. Uh, we were actually able to, to make a, um, this material without any, any additional pigments, but the, the colors that we are able to get from the cactus feedstock along chlorophyll. And it's very interesting what we were uh, hearing uh, a second ago because this material, this color is not as resistant as all the others that we offer with organic pigments because exposure to UV rays turned the, the brown uh, shade to like uh, darker. And um, we agree, we agree. Uh, it's, uh, it's part of the beauty of the material and its originality. and. Uh, it's different and we are always open and, and proactively looking to, to make uh, different lines within what we offer to, to try to satisfy the different necessities of a, of a diverse industry. I think that's a beautiful color actually, the one that you just held up. That really does look like, uh, like leather in some way, you know? I'm yeah. wondering, you know, it, I'm wondering how something would look, you know, with that type of that type of color. Now, there's of course different ways you can protect inks from UV rays. You can play with refraction of the sun. Uh, you know, shellac, uh, which is something that Kim uses in her uh, in her products, which is also derived from insects. Unfortunately, it's it's a bit rigid as a material, but it can be softened using glycerols and and using even magnesium oxides. And also mag magnesium oxides have these properties of protecting colors or even uh, synthetic stains from the sun because they, they have the capacity of absorbing UV light. So perhaps particles of nanoparticles or, or microparticles of metal oxides could be something used in inks or maybe even the, uh, if you decided to apply a natural stain for, for, your, for your deserto line, it could be interesting now I, I find it also uh interesting that kim uses uh shellac because shellac is a is it used to be a french an old 1800 and 1600 technique of polish like the french polish and what what does that give your material lee um kim what does that give your material oh it makes my product you know my products are made of paper and it is very vulnerable so um, I didn't want to use single-use product, and and I had to make them water resistance. First, I tried to use Korean traditional coating solution, which is Ochil, but it does bring only brown color, and I wanted to make a realize a fresh green color on my product, which is the most popular one in the shop. And then I found the shell. I didn't really know about the material, but seven years ago when I started this project, but um, it was um, European technique, which is, has been used for a long time to coating violins, musical instrument and furniture. And there are many possibilities, you know, actually Shellac also using for the nail manicure. So we can mix with other pigment to make um, different color, so I can find, um, I can also mix with other um, ingredient to realize the, the color, whatever I want to apply on my product. I see, I see. The, the, another property which is very interesting of shellac is its resistance to water. And so it, it becomes uh, useful for uh, insulating 
uh, from water certain types of materials. But um, I have a question, Anastasia. I mean, I'm, di I'm dying to ask you, can, can we ingest these, these pigments? I mean, are they so safe that we could actually eat them? Uh, when you extract the pigment, uh, I have been uh, tasting <laughs> a lot of different uh, teas, uh, let's say infusions, and they have uh, very medicinal properties. I have been drinking the onion skins um, infusion, um, garlic skins infusion, doesn't give you a color, but it's still very healthy. Um, uh, of course, this needs to happen before the textile dyeing process because in the textile dyeing process you would need to mordant your fabrics with salts such as alum or iron, so this wouldn't be uh, good to consume in high concentration. Um, but as soon as you extract them, yes, you can. And it is um, there are studies that um, they reveal uh, that the it is the chromatin uh, in the vegetables that has anti-cancerogenous properties. Uh, so some vegetables are known for their uh, medicinal properties. Uh, the, it's the color molecule that is uh, uh, doing this. That's very interesting you say that because uh, the chemistry is such a strange field that you, you, you can arrive to the conclusion that the shape of a molecule, the composition of a molecule, will have specific types of properties. And as we were mentioning earlier, to protect color, you could use zinc oxides, perhaps. And these also have antiviral and antibacterial properties, which is per perhaps something interesting when, when we're talking about, you know, using materials to cover seats or to make uh, maybe even medical equipment. And do you see this? Do you see that perhaps deserto could have a layer of photocatalytic or maybe antiviral, antibacterial applications? Yeah. Um, well, um, absolutely. Um, it is a very interesting area to explore. Currently, our materials do have um, antibacterial uh, properties um, that we have to develop because there is a lot of organic biomass within it. So if we didn't do that, then we can have like fungi bacteria grow, which uh, can affect the, the quality of the material. Now, uh, while well, saying that, it is true that there are many ways of achieving it. The techniques that we, that we use in our materials are of course safe substances which are aligned with the with the most rigorous environmental standards and are not considered as high concern substances. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's very interesting. Of it's, I think it's a it's a challenge of when you are making a material with the highest um, plant based content possible. But at the same time, you are trying to deliver performance and you are trying to deliver aesthetics. Um, you have to, to be very creative and try to, to find the, the right formulation to, to balance all these different aspects that, that, offer, that make the material. Yeah. Yeah, that can be very difficult, especially when, when uh, we are approaching new industries uh, we're not so sure. Maybe some of us are designers and we're, we're exploring uh, mi mixtures of chemistry and some of us are designing solids and we're wondering what kind of environments uh, these might be put in. And uh, I, I was, I was when you were talking about the cacti and uh, myself, I'm, I'm a big fan of cacti. I have many cacti in my garden. Uh, and I, I always, I'm always surprised by the design of the structure, not specifically Nopal, but most of the, 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 the towering cacti, they have this surface, this nano surface, that if the water forms on top, it creates like a water bead, and the bead goes straight to the root. And I just think that's such an ingenious way. And if we look at this in a microscope, what we'll actually see is geometry. We see these 
structures on the surface. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, I'm wondering if we could apply in this biomimicry approach towards, you know, textiles, towards inks, or towards paper, and 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 perhaps elaborate it. I don't know if you guys some have some ideas or if you have some experience with that. Yes, it is. It is very very interesting what you are mentioning. Um, you know, at the um, at the farm we have run like uh, many basic experiments to 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 let us be amazed by the efficiency of the plants of the cactuses. You know, um, about eighty percent of the of the of the leaf when it's in the plant, the weight comes from water. And there is no irrigation applied to it. So then you wonder like how efficient this plant, the cactuses are at absorbing water and uh, maximizing the use of the scarf resources that they have available to grow. Um, if, you, if you remove with a knife the, the very top uh, layer of the skin of the, of the cactus, and you put it under a microscope, you can actually see the stomas of it. And uh, the, the, the biology of the plant, the, the, the type of uh, structure that it has and the efficiency that it gives cactuses to, to absorb water and to protect it, not to be absorbed from, from sunlight, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, if you peel one cactus leaf, like you take off that little layer only in one area and you then drop it, at the next day it's gonna be totally dry. You, you will only have fibers. But if you cut one leaf and you throw it to the, to the ground, at the next day you are not going to see any, any harm to the, to the leaf. And after a few days it is going to start to grow root and the same, the same leaf is going to become a new cactus plant. That, so it is um, a super efficient plant, not only in terms of maximizing the resources, but it's also amazing how easy to plant it is. You don't have to wait, you just cut one mature leaf, you can throw it, it doesn't matter in which position, and then it will just start to grow roots and, and new leaves. So, it's uh it's really really amazing interesting to, to look at it yeah that's i think that's i think they have a word called survival for that <laughs> right this is survival yeah. techniques when there's no water you yeah. know you have to somehow make up some other way um yeah. I'm, I'm, can you make paper from nopal as well do you think because yeah. is it a material yeah absolutely it is possible and uh um, and something else that I that I forgot to mention is that when when we look at the cactus leaf, you see a lot of dots. Each each dot of it, it's a potential spot where a new leaf can grow. So so you just can't imagine like a, how many exits the the plant have to 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 assure its survival. Um, <laughs> regarding the paper. Yes, it is possible, 100%, it is. Um, actually, it will be much more easier than, than making the, the current material that we make um, and for a whole different application. Um, but uh, we, are, we are happy to, to, to collaborate, to, to, to make those trials because, I mean, paper is, is another very important uh, product that needs sustainability to be addressed and some alternative yeah. put on the table. Yeah, sure, and just and just the sheer amount of paper that's produced every day. I'm, I'm actually, I, I, I have a secret passion for paper. I love paper and different types of paper. Um, I spend most of my morning studying and I write on books. And so I can tell when good paper is used or heavy paper or light paper and the colors that these might have. I'm I'm wondering, you know, Kim, is is the is the Hanji paper is that soft or is it is it like a like a textured paper or what is it like? Does it compare? Oh, well, there are a thousand types of Hanji paper. 
you know, what I really like about Hanji is um, it's a locker based material, but also there are so many um, opportunity to work with the low material. So there are um, uh, different types. So just normal Hanji paper, which has been used for a flooring material or wallpaper in South Korea. And there are conservation grade Hanji. So um, they, it's a conservator, paper conservator, they're using Hanji to fix all the traditional something. So recently, Hanji has been uh, exported to Louvre Museum in France to conservate something. And also it has been used for um, fixed uh, globe in Vatican in Rome. So that's uh, another type of Hanji, very expensive. So mm. I have no chance to use them. <laughs> And there are um, nanotechnic uh, related hanji, so it's a machine made hanji because most of the hanji are handmade, but they're very expensive and difficult to um, compete with the modern materials. So uh, machine made hanji is um, uh, you um, the material for the notebooks or something feeling like a leather something like a, a mask, facial mask material. So you know, the Korean oh. cosmetic is very famous in Europe as well. So I think, have you ever seen the facial mask that ladies put on their face every night to make their skin soft, you know? So they use, uh, the part has been used a lot for the, the keeping these um, essential oil for the face. But Hanji also, there are Hanji types of facial mask. So uh, there are so many. I, I would like to send some samples to Metafed. We so would love that. So, so you can study about. Absolutely. Um, I have one last question. Anastasia, how do we make green? How do we make green ink? Can we? Yes, of course we can. We We have been... You can make any color, but uh, you need to understand that where the color you want to make will be will be coming from. So in our research, we try to use locally sourced uh, materials. Mm -hmm. uh, we will not use, for example, uh, logwood or campeche that we cannot find. So we have been making very light greens uh, with spinach before consuming the spinach, uh, steaming it. And um, I would, um, I, I was more inspired with the, the things that you were saying before. It's always very nice to talk to you because I already <laughs> have notes for new recipes and things. It's amazing. You always have a lot of information in in every single phrase. But I was um, I was thinking that um, the the fact that we are designing materials um, gives us the power as designers to be able to design material properties, design performance, design aesthetical qualities and also design lifetime. So I, I would like to uh, more end uh, in uh, this um, Thank saying. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anastasia. And thank you, all of you again, Kim, Anastasia, Adriani, Marte. Thank you for joining us and sharing all your wonderful innovations and concepts. Uh, keep charging forward with innovation. Keep positive, And let's, let's make this place a better place. I want to thank you also, all of you that have been listening from afar and uh, taking notes, perhaps getting inspired uh, to do new things with our time and this life. And I just want to make a brief reminder that at four, uh, there will be the webinar from the CCAM. So stay put. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful day.